So welcome to Fort Meigs. Um, very glad that you can make it. Fort Meigs is, oh, we call it Ohio's eight, War of 1812 battlefield. I like to call it Ohio's most significant War of 1812 battlefield because there were some other activities elsewhere in Ohio during the war. Um, just to orient you to the site, uh, you have obviously the museum and gift shop, bookstore here. Uh, if you haven't seen it just inside the glass doors, there's a very good video that will further orient you to the, we haven't yet. the War of 1812 and Fort Meg's role here. And down the hall here is a really superb museum. If, if you haven't been in there yet, I really encourage you to see it. It's top notch. Um, I'm a history buff, obviously, and I've been to a lot of historical sites uh, whose museums don't compare nearly as well with this one. Um, so why is Fort Meigs here? Well, to give you a little deeper background, uh, the British and French were at war, the Napoleonic Wars, in the early part of, uh, like from about 1803 on. Uh, one of the reasons that the United States went to war with Britain was during the Napoleonic War, we were delivering supplies and goods to both the French and the British. Neither side appreciated that. The French couldn't do anything about us delivering supplies to the British, but the British with the Royal Navy could definitely interfere with our trade on the high seas. They did that by stopping our ships at sea, seizing the cargoes, and taking off sailors. Uh, this was called impressment. If they suspected a, a sailor on an American ship had been a British subject at one time or had been a British deserter, they would seize that person and take them into the Royal Navy or into the British Royal or uh, British Marine. So uh, sailors' rights was one of the issues, uh, free, free trade and sailors' rights. Another big issue was here on the western frontier, uh, we had what was called the Sixty Years' War for Ohio. Starting in about 1750 with the French and Indian War, um, Native Americans in this area tried to resist American settlement coming from east of the Appalachians into this area and also north of the Ohio River. Uh, the war went on through a number of conflicts. We have another battlefield just up the river uh, on the other side of the river. Uh, the Battle of Fallen Timbers was fought in 1792. It was a very significant battle. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about it, but that was part of the Northwest Indian Wars. In any event, we had 60 years of conflict between American settlers and Native Americans. In the early part of the uh, 19th century, this period we're talking about, the British were providing trade goods, muskets, gunpowder to the Indians. They weren't specifically inciting the Indians to fight American settlers, but they were facilitating it uh, by providing trade goods, weapons, gunpowder, scalping knives, tomahawks, etc. And uh, this was a, a, a source of great irritation, obviously, to the Americans when the Indians would attack their settlements, kill their people. Um, so we had that issue. Also, there was a large contingent in Congress called the Warhawks. These were Western congressmen who were interested in expanding into this area because of the opportunities for land speculation, a lot of money to be made on land speculation. So. Those congressmen were, in, were supportive of a declaration of war against Britain. In any event, in July 1st of 1812, uh, President Madison asked for a declaration of war. It was approved by Congress on July 18th of 1812. Because of communications difficulties, the British forces in Upper Canada, which is now Ontario, learned about the war before our forces did here in Ohio and Michigan. And early in July, uh, Fort Mackinac, was taken by the British. The American troops there didn't even know war had been declared. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Fort Dearborn in what is now Chicago was taken uh, by the Native Americans, burned to the ground, and the garrison was massacred when they were marched out. Fort Wayne in Indiana Territory was also besieged by the natives, uh, but they held out. They, that, that fort was not taken. Most significantly, Fort Detroit fell on August 16, 1812. General Hall, who was the commander of the American Army of the Northwest, was also the uh, territorial governor of Michigan. He had marched up, taken an army up into Detroit, but when he heard about the fall of 
Fort Dearborn and the massacre there. And the British commander that was uh, attacking Fort Detroit, besieging it, threatened Hull with a massacre if he did not surrender Detroit. Hull decided to surrender the fort. So he surrendered Fort Detroit, with it the Michigan Territory, and with it the, the American Army of the Northwest. So we have no army here. General William Henry Harrison, who was the territorial governor of Indiana, was then appointed to build a new army of the Northwest for the United States. His goals would be to retake Detroit, defend against further British invasions into Ohio, and ultimately invade Canada. So General uh, Harrison starts to assemble an army. He's going throughout Ohio and this region recruiting. Um, the army would be reconstituted from three wings. One wing would come from Fort Wayne under General Winchester. One wing would come from Cincinnati under General Tupper, General William Tupper. And another wing is gonna come from Pennsylvania under General Joel Leftwich. From Pennsylvania, it's Pennsylvania and Virginia volunteers plus U.S. artillery. From Cincinnati, it's Ohio militia. And from Fort Wayne, it's gonna be Kentucky militia that are coming here to meet at the, what's called the foot of the rapids of the Maumee, which is just below the bluff here. Uh, they'll combine there, and then the intent for Harrison is to go up, retake Detroit, and ultimately invade Canada. General Winchester gets here first with his Kentucky militia. Um, he sees an opportunity to take the initiative and move up against the British for two reasons. One, the, there are people in Frenchtown, Michigan Territory, which is now Monroe, uh, they come down and they complain that they're being harassed by the British. They also offer supplies to Winchester and his troops, and they were running short of supplies. So Winchester goes up with his one-third of the army, ignores his orders to stay here at the, the Rapids, goes to Frenchtown, and defeats the British and Indians at the, at the Battle of the River Raisin. So Winchester defeats the British there. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I'm former military, and I know that when you've had a successful attack, the first thing you do afterwards is prepare for the counterattack. Winchester didn't do that. So four days after the battle, the British and Indians return, and they defeat the American army under Winchester. Uh, not only that, but the, the American wounded that were not able to be taken into captivity, they're left in Frenchtown, in the homes of the inhabitants there. The Indians come back a day or two later, burn the homes, whip the wounded inside, uh, tomahawk those who are trying to escape, and it's called the, the River Raisin Massacre. So this becomes a huge rallying cry for American forces. Remember the River Raisin. It, it's like, remember Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. remember the Alamo. At that time, it was remember the Raisin. So we've lost Winchester and his forces. Leftwich and uh, Tupper arrive here. And now that uh, Harrison's forces are reduced, he decides to build a, a fortification here at the foot of the rapids uh, so he can reconstitute his forces, build supplies for the invasion of Canada, and basically uh, get prepared to carry on the war in, in an aggressive manner. Uh, why here? The foot of the rapids of the Maumee, it's the first place on the Maumee River where people could actually ford by wagons or horses or actually walking across. Uh, at times it's shallow enough here at the rapids you can walk across the river. But the Maumee was a great barrier from anyone coming from the north into Ohio. And this is the first place where the barrier was not quite so significant. So it was chosen for that reason. Also there were military roads right here because of that ford. General Hall on his way to Detroit and Harrison on his way here had built military roads through what was called the Great Black Swamp. Most of northwestern Ohio at that time was called the Great Black Swamp. It was uh, all forests and wetlands and swampy ground, very difficult to traverse. So these military roads would have been very important to the British if they had wanted to go into Ohio. Um, Another reason he chose this site is because it's on an elevated bluff over the river. He could command the fords with artillery or with his infantry. So in February of 1813, they start to build Fort Meigs. It takes about uh, two months. The construction is in fits and starts. 
Uh, Harrison leaves for a while, leaves construction in charge of General Leftwich. He's not very uh, uh, aggressive in continuing the construction. Actually, some of the pickets are pulled down by the troops to burn for firewood. So anyway, he when Harrison subsequently appoints two professional engineers and they, they complete the, the fort. Just in time for the British to come down in uh, late April and besiege the fort. So um, let's walk to the doors and I can at least point out some of the features of the fort. So the fort uh, is built of uh, log palisades, it has palisade wall. The perimeter of the fort is just under a mile. It's the largest reconstructed wooden wall fortification in the area right now. And it's very accurately reconstructed. Some of the features, like this gate, are within three inches of where the original part of the structure stood. Uh, there was a, when, the fort, when the fort was reconstructed in the late 70s, and then again in, uh, in 2003, there was a lot of archaeology that was done, so they know exactly where the walls were, they know exactly where the blockhouses were, and the gates. So a uh, mile around, it encloses just under 10 acres. It has seven blockhouses. These are the large structures on the corners. The blockhouses provided protection of the walls. They project out from the wall so that infantry fire could be shot down the length of the wall to protect the walls themselves. Inside the, each blockhouse, there was a cannon on the first floor. And there are loopholes in the second floor. You can see the small holes in the mm -hmm. walls. Those are loopholes for musketry. So there would be riflemen or infantry in the second floor and cannon, a can, at least one cannon uh, on the first floor. Uh, each of the gates is defended on the inside by what's called a traverse. It's a large mound of earth behind which defenders could, could stand to protect the gate from the inside if the gate was attacked. Inside the fort, General Harrison directed the construction of what are called traverses, like the small ones inside the gates. But, uh, for example, the, the Grand Traverse and the other larger traverses run the length of the fort. These were 15, about 15, well, 20 feet at the base, 15, 12 to 15 feet tall, long earthwork designed to absorb uh, cannon fire, solid shot or shells coming in. And to protect the troops, all the troops were quartered inside the uh, the fort. They lived in tents. It was February, March. The weather was miserable, uh, rainy, snowy. This was originally swampy land, so all of the tents. There were diary entries that talk about the amount of water and mud inside the tents. You couldn't walk from one area to another without mud over your shoe tops. There was a lot of illness. There was uh, dysentery. There was uh, typhus, there was influenza, pneumonia, mumps, measles. So there were quite a few casualties due to illness here while the army was in the fort. The reason the traverses were so significant is because when the British arrived at the end of April, across the river is now known as the city of Maumee. Back then it was just forest. They constructed artillery batteries. There was a King's Battery and a Queen's Battery. And they, had, they could fire directly into the fort from across the river. Uh, the British also built a secondary battery about a quarter of a mile east of the fort in what is now the Fort Meigs Union Cemetery. And you can actually still see that part of that uh, battery still exists. So they had the fort in a crossfire. So the traverses were built to protect the troops from incoming artillery rounds. So, why were all these military activities the siege is significant? The significance of Fort Meigs is that it pre prevented a British invasion of Ohio. While Proctor was here engaged trying to take Fort Meigs, the British Navy was supporting them with supplies, and uh, they had control of Lake Erie. But while they were engaged supporting Proctor, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry was able to complete his American ships in Erie, Pennsylvania, what is now Erie, Pennsylvania, and moved the American fleet out onto Lake Erie. He came down the lake uh, from Pennsylvania to uh, 
what are called the Bass Islands, just offshore off Lake Erie between Michigan and Ohio. Right. Established a base there, and on September 10th, 1813, actually engaged the British fleet on Lake Erie and defeated them. So while the, again, while the British were engaged here, Perry was able to complete his fleet and go out ultimately and defeat the British fleet on Lake Erie. Mm. That made Perry's fleet available to transport Harrison and his army for the invasion of Canada. So Harrison organized his army, uh, put him aboard Perry's ships. He transported them up the lake and then up the Detroit River to Fort Baldwin, which is in Amherstburg, uh, Ontario, right across from that Detroit. Proctor and Tecumseh, with their forces, abandoned Fort Baldwin and retreated into Canada. Harrison pursues uh, and brings them to battle near Chatham, Ontario, in what's called the Battle of the Thames. The British are defeated. Tecumseh is killed in the battle. That breaks the British Indian Alliance. It also breaks Tecumseh's Indian Confederacy, which was established to resist America. That was so needed right there. there. Yeah, that, that was it. Yeah. Wow. And so that was that was the end of military operations in the West, but a very important uh, outcome. I am dressed as a private in the second U.S. artillery, which was present here at Fort Meigs, uh, arriving in February 1813, and during the sieges here. There was a great deal of action here. The first siege began in late April, uh, the 1st of May. 1813, uh, and action took place for five days, uh, and then we had a cooling off period. There was a second siege in late July, 1813, and this was really the turning point in the war here in the Old Northwest. The United States had suffered a series of defeats prior to that, and finally with the repulse of the British and the forces, that summer of 1813, we were able to uh, regroup and go on the offensive.